Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Meet Your Neighbors. Today, we put a little bit of a twist on our presentation. David's on camera, and Joe is my co-host, so welcome, Joe. You're in for a real treat today. Joe and I had the privilege of talking with Spencer Lucky. Uh, he is a native of Brantford. He grew in Short Beach, and um, he is the um, creative, passionate, intelligent force behind the designs of the Lucky Climbers. So welcome, Spencer. Thank I'm you. I'm delighted to be with you today. You know, you might wonder why I'm the one standing, but I'll tell you why. I never sat in such a beautiful chair before. So David, if you don't mind zooming in, and Spencer, can you tell our viewers how that chair is made? Yeah, so um, I came up with this idea in architecture school about a, a chair that was made similar to the way that we made um, stepped terrain models in architecture school. Um, because we were all very poor, these, these uh, classmates of mine figured out that you could economize um, on, a, on a terrain model by cutting every other thing in a, in a pattern. So then I just basically did the same thing. So this chair came out of one sheet of plywood using these two sort of um, sets of, of concentric um, circles. And then you, you nest them back together again and locate them very precisely with dowels. And this is what you get. Love it. I it's just cool. love it. And you're painted with car paint. This is, I think, a Nissan Murano car paint. And each one is yep. so beautifully painted and someone left natural. Well, anyway, now I'm going to sit. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful to be here with you today. And I uh, understand you grew up in an extremely creative family environment. Um, your father was a graduate of the Yale um, School of Architecture, Correct. I believe, and he was always um, creating, uh, building things, um, mostly from wood, I think. Um, but could you tell us uh, a, some of the, the, especially the things that he liked to, to build or create? Sure. Yeah. Well, when he got out of architecture school, he went, you know, like like any student would do um, of architecture. Uh, he went and got a job in the field and um, took an internship up in Boston. And pretty quickly, he learned that he didn't like sitting down as much as you have to as an architect, which is, you know, I don't know something I grappled with as well. But um, so then he he quit his job and he got into making furniture out of wood, kind of in the mode of like Noguchi or somebody like that. And he made some really beautiful um, furniture pieces. And um, and then he also used to make us a lot of um, toys for Christmas, my, my older sister and I. And my theory is that one year, January rolled around, and he had a big hangover from making all this great stuff for us. And he thought, you know, how can I just keep the party going? And so then he got into making merry-go-rounds. Wow. And um, these were very sort of oddball structures. And they had, um, they were hand, they were all hand powered, and they worked on the grand right and left principle. So there were these six columns, and they would pass the chairs around in this sort of um, swirly figure eight kind of thing. And um, so he did that for a great many years until he made one that was on wheels. And then um, he took it down to New York City to Central Park and um, got it going and everything. And this woman showed up named Agnes Gunt, who was, um, who is a, a pretty well-to-do uh, art philanthropist in New York City. She's got her name on, the, on a, a wing of MoMA. Wow. And she said, Tom, you're clearly very talented, but kind of misguided. You're gonna kill somebody <laughs> with one of these things. Um, why don't you go up to the Boston Children's Museum and I'll pay for whatever it is the two of you come up with. And that's where the, the climber business was born. Oh, unbelievable. Oh, yeah. such an interesting story. Um, so Spencer, I know you had mentioned that your dad um, put on about 22 additions onto his home, which to me is like a staggering <laughs> Right? And uh, I know that um, 
probably many of them were charming or, or just very imaginative, creative, but I know you also mentioned um, that not all of them were perfectly up to code. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm mentioning that because I'm going to take you, if I may, yeah. 12 years back. Uh -huh. and to that dreaded night with that horrific accident and which changed not only your dad's life but your life forever. Would you kindly explain to our audience what Yeah, happened? so um, the, the first addition he did to the house um, was to, um, there was a little tiny backyard that was maybe six feet wide and so the house ended here and there was this little slot of, of yard here, and then there was this giant boulder. And so he um, ripped out the, removed the first floor wall and built the gable across to the, to the, to the rock wall and had skylights. He, for $100, he got 25 um, <laughs> skylights. Wow. So, um, so off the back of a truck. This is 1975 yeah. or 76. And so, um, he made this room that was, you know, in the, we called it the rock room. And then he removed all the sashes from the windows on the second floor. And this is an older house, so the sash was maybe 16, 14 inches high. And the toilet was right next door to it, right next, right beside it. So um, one morning, actually, it was the, the morning before my wife and I got married, um, he was standing there taking a leak at five o'clock in the morning and he fainted at men when they get older their prostate grows and it requires more blood and if you really have to go pee it can really be a problem so basically um, he fainted and fell out the window yeah. and he fell on his head he fell on his head and he you know, broke his neck and um, was a quadriplegic for the thereafter yeah. it's just so so tragic but I know what happened is after the accident, um, you wanted to step in. You also are a graduate of Yale School of, of Architecture. You wanted to step in and help save his business. Yeah. And I know you said to us when we talked in the past that you enjoyed to collaborating, and, but you thought that you would take the reins. Your dad, as I understand it, was passionate also about his work. Um, he considered himself a sculptor, a sculptor, he liked risk, but he considered himself a solo artist. And I <laughs> accentuate solo. Yeah. So how did working together professionally impact your relationship? Um, well, we had a, a long uh, history of con a con sort of contentious working relationship. Um, when we worked together prior in, the, um, in my 20s, we had this fantasy company that we called The Arguing Men. Oh. And, <laughs> and so, you know, we had this sort of idea, somebody would call, you know, and say, oh yeah, I don't know if we can do it, but maybe, you know, I, don't, we, we, I, I think this is a job for The Arguing Men. <laughs> and um, so we have, you know, fantasy clients and everything. <laughs> anyway, so it was kind of like this, sort of already had happened in some version or another. You know, we, we had a, uh, a racing a 505 sailboat that we raced some summers. Wow. And, um, you know, we'd made a lot of things. I'd actually worked for him a fair amount. And so we had a kind of a, a, a slightly evolved um, working relationship. But it wasn't, this was, cl the climbers were clearly his domain. Yeah. But I was, uh, you know, an ambitious, younger man at the time and um, saw opportunity and so there was there was some conflict I'm not gonna um, but you know really it was uh, we became very after you know the first year after an accident like that I think is very hard for everybody there's just a lot of tragedy and a lot of collateral damage that happens and um, and it was just the, the first few years were very kind of dynamic in a way. Um, a lot of things sort of coming and going. You, nobody really understood how, you know, what the next week would look like, much less the next year. Yeah. So it was very complicated. And, um, and, and my sole mission at that point was to try to keep the business going and in a way that would help him keep his mind active and, um, 
and keep the business afloat. You know, I had a big, or not a big investment, but I had some emotional investment in the company because I'd worked there quite a bit and uh, and I really wanted to see it succeed. I really didn't want to, I mean, that was my main thing was just don't fail. Yes. I mean, I thought if I'm going to get involved with this, it's got to be um, superlative. And I'd also learned all of these things in school that, um, you know, I, I, these not only like design principles, but actual techniques that I thought would be really useful to the company. And actually my inroad into the, to, to the company um, following my father's accident was when he was still in the hospital, I went up there and you know, he'd been trying with one of his employees to make a physical model, but that's really hard. I mean, he, prior to that, he'd just done all of his designs in these physical models yes. and they were beautiful. Um, but they required him and his attention to detail, to execute. There wasn't really, you know, you couldn't just pluck somebody off the street and tell them that, you know, they, which is essentially what he'd done. And um, so um, I went to his hospital room with an extra monitor and I plopped it down on his, you know, the little tray in front of his bed. And I said, we're going to work on this project and we're just going to do it until it's done. And that's what we did. And then um, I made a, a physical model of that, as was required by his contract. And then I flew it out to Chicago, wow. and I presented it to the client, and they loved it, and we built it. Wow. And it was, um, you know, it was a, it was a, it worked. You know, the the process worked. Um, but then the next project, you know, the, we had, I wanted to try some things. He wanted to try other things. I can't say that I was an angel. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we, we had this sort of, there was some Oedipal urges, but it, you know, it, it kind of, I tempered myself and he tempered himself and eventually we figured out a way of working together. It really wasn't that we would work together. I gotta be totally honest about that. We, it was, it was, it was more like, um, he would, I would, I had this policy where I would always give him the first few swings of whatever design oh, came down the pike. And, um, and then if, if it was good, I would act as editor. And um, because he never, you know, he had these these sort of intern type people working with him. So it just always kind of needed some jostling. But that's like, we do that here. Um, and then it, if it wasn't great, I mean, because not only, oftentimes his health is compromised. Okay. And so, and in ways that really do affect the, you know, cognition and stuff like that. So. He wasn't always at his best, and so I, I was, you know, I would try to step in, and and if it didn't look like it was going the right way with him and the client, I would step in and and, and do what I had to do because yes. I just so I would always keep a design in my pocket um, because I just thought it, it really we, we need to do the, it always has to be the best no matter what it is it can't just be about you know him or me it has to be about the you know, the future. Of the exactly, and you did certainly say that. Well, thank you. You, you moved on to, hmm. to many, many more designs. Um, now, your father uh, lived to see uh, or get to know your, your son, his grandson, mm -hmm. um, who's now 11 years old. That's so right. that must have been gratifying. Yeah. And also, he lived to see the completion of the uh, um, lucky climber that he designed for the Boston Children's Museum. Yeah. And, and after his accident, um, from what I understand, you were really instrumental in uh, the, con the final construction and building of that lucky climber. And I've also heard that that's the most popular attraction at the museum. Absolutely. Like, and most of our climbers are the most popular <laughs> they are. No, truly. I could give you statistics, <laughs> but I, I can believe it. Boring. And, um, yeah, no, he and I worked together on, on the Boston Children's Museum climber. It's, we'd actually worked on that climber while I was in graduate school and and the year following. And you know, I would moonlight with him and do it. So I, I understood all of the issues and what we were, you know, the whole thing. And after his accident, he had this whole sort of, I don't know, he had this way of like self-sabotaging his designs so that he could buy himself more time to, to do whatever he, because he just liked the process of design, you know? 
yeah. and he liked making models. So actually, the one that got built was was one that you know he and I had talked about, and um, you know we just one day just kind of just made it manifest, I guess. And the the big issue with that one was um, that it was too big for the shop that I was in, and um, and its geometry was too complicated. So I had to, for the first time, make a, a climber that was really pushed through the, the computer more than anything else. We didn't use any of the old techniques that he'd used. He, he was kind of um, a 19th century craftsman in a way. You know, he was sort of like the way that um, people used to draw and then build boats by lofting them and stuff like That's that. Right. He had a lot of the same techniques, um, but the way that we did it was much more jet age, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, so you, after Boston and even before, you collaborated with your father uh, quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I was wondering, how many lucky climbers have you actually um, built over the years? Um, I think it's over. It's around a hundred. I'm around not 100, really yeah. sure. And that's just just amazing to me. And I, I was well, a lot of playground equipment's put out like 500. Oh yes. yeah, well yeah, <laughs> and not, year. not like these. Yeah. <laughs> well yeah, <laughs> sliding boards and things like that. Um, but I was I was Where's wondering, one? where are some of these? I mean, are these located? I know that uh, there's quite a few that are outside of the United States. I yep. understand. Yeah, so we've done about a dozen or so projects overseas. Um, you know, a couple in Beijing. Two in South Korea, one in Hong Kong, Jakarta, um, Singapore, Kuwait. We have a job coming up in Qatar, wow. um, Switzerland, France, oh. and uh, Northern Ireland, oh my and Mexico, gosh. and Costa Rica. Oh my I mean, goodness. that's just totally amazing. Oh, and two in, two in Russia. In oh. Russia. Yeah, that's right. One in Moscow. I mean, that's just so, so totally, totally amazing. And I know we, you talked about um, Lucky Climbers being in children's museums. Is that where most of them are located, or are they just... Uh, yeah, a good portion of them. That's where well, we cut, yeah. our, cut our teeth. Um, yeah. But around about, I guess it was 2010, yeah, it was about 2010. We um, we got a job in a oh, we got a job in a mall in Los Angeles, which mm -hmm. turned out to be a really big deal. My father had done projects in malls prior back in the in the 90s, but um, for whatever reason, mall company he, he only did about three of them. They would hire him, he would make the thing, and then that would be it. But I was really intent on creating a. a lasting relationship with these people because the children's museum business is great except that one children's museum only buys one climber what? right exactly. and yeah. <laughs> so the malls are really fabulous because the mall a big big time mall operator will own hundreds of malls okay. and so um so i reasoned that if i just schmooze them successfully that that one would lead lead to many others and it's Pretty amazing, actually. That one was in LA, and we've since done about five more climbers. Some of them quite large in scale in and around LA. And I thought, well, I thought wonderful. that you'd reach a sort of saturation point, but they and then coming. and then and then nobody would want any more in yeah. LA. But there's a wow. lot of people in yeah. LA. <laughs> <That's> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, That's and you know what? You know, just to, totally fascinates me. And the question I, you know, that I'm really curious about is how. How do you find uh, clients in places like Moscow, you said, or Beijing, or Jakarta? Well, how I, that, don't how I don't know. I don't choose my clients. Yeah. That's the thing. I don't. It, they come to me. By like word of mouth, then? I think a lot of it is word of mouth. I mean, the mall, you know, the children's museum people pay attention to each other in a really big way. I mean, there's a conference, yeah. and, um, and, you know, they, they're all friends. It's a small community. And um, so that's easy to understand. And the science centers are kind of the same way. And the mall people, it turns out, are very much the same way. I mean, a lot. I think a lot of the work we do, probably a good, you know, well over half, comes not from any kind of marketing or anything, but just straight up old, good old fashioned 
word of mouth. Wow. The best that's, way. Yeah. It's amazing. It's the best way. So Spencer, how many people do you have working with you? About 20. 20. Okay, excellent. And um, are you installing any lucky climbers as we speak? Um, we just finished one down in Carlsbad, California, as well as another one at a Chuck E. Cheese oh. down in oh, yeah. Fort Worth, Texas. Oh, right. And, <laughs> and Chuck E. Cheese is a chain, so yeah, that's that right. might spread too. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> it's a corporate owned chain. Corporate, it's, not yeah. a, um, it's not a franchise model. Yeah. So that's actually a really unique opportunity. Okay. I mean, as, a, as an artist, um, you know, I tend to evaluate success or failure on sort of like the number of smiles or something like yeah. that. And I see Chuck E. Cheese is like a inroad into millions and millions oh, yeah, of smiles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, That's excellent. Yeah. That's great. You know, and, and at this point, I was wondering if we, uh, maybe we could talk about this, this kind of really immense area um, that you have here um, for once the designs are all done, you know, that kind of work is done, you, you act, that's where the magic starts, it seems like to me, uh, where you know these lucky climbers actually get built. Yeah. And you have all these, you know, well, yeah. there's one right here, like large pipes that are twisted and bent. And oops, sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe we could talk, you know, kind of look at some of the, uh, sure. you know, the stuff that's here in this Yeah, uh, because area. you actually made it, you brought in some of the, the, the materials and from the campus right here on our yeah. set. Yeah. So if you want to share some so, of that. So um, we could stand up. So this climber is called our dance model and um, it's composed of three helixes and these two hoops and kind of turning into this crazy looking thing. And um, it's meant to be sort of figural. And uh, we get these pipes a few years ago. Um, I sort of wanted to, to you know, we started out with flat plywood, and then my father um, started making wavy plywood like this, but it was all straight, it had straight edges. And, um, but then he started making the edge crazy. So it was like, you know, we, he took the straight thing and made it wacky, and then he made it wacky in three dimensions. And um, so I thought I could do the same thing with, with steel pipes. And so this is an example of one of those, of those uh, structures. And, um, Rather than getting a straight, just a curve on in one dimension, I asked the guy to make the pipes or bend the pipes. Um, what the most complicated shape is is they, they kind of get one shot into helix. So that's what these are. And in this case, it's two helixes that go one way and another helix that goes the other way. And I don't know why that's important, but it just makes a nicer composition for something to so sort of twist and turn around to each other in a pleasing way. Um, on the floor here, we have uh, this is a panel that's very similar to the one that will actually ultimately be attached to this thing, which is why I want to attach. Um, and it's roto molded plastic, very similar to a kayak or something like that. It's made out of high density polyethylene, the, um, which is the same material that they use to make like, milk jugs and stuff like that, so it's safe for kids. Um, and this is a panel that actually did not get installed in Moscow for the project that we did at the IKEA there, but it's kind of cool in that this is an um, image from a Hubble Space Telescope, from the Hubble Space Telescope, and I sold it to the Russians, so I think that's funny. So Spencer, this might be a good time to show our viewers some of the awesome uh, creations that you have installed different parts of the world. Yeah. Um, and as you go along, if you'd be willing to, um, I mean, I know that your uh, climbers are not only beautiful, but there's great pride that they're safe. And I know with the 100 climbers that you have installed, um, there's not one accident that has been reported. And that's really something to be proud about. So if I may ask that as you go along, if you can sort of share with our viewers, how is safety built into them? And also when you um, have a building or a facility in mind, how do you weave uh, the climber into the character of the building? Those are okay. excellent questions. 
So um, this project here is in uh, Brookings, South Dakota, and um, it's meant to be a, kind of like a cloud. So next slide, please. Um, and this, oh, this slide here shows um, obviously a girl in green green shirt and a kid in green pants, but um, also this distance between here and here is never more than about 18 inches. And um, that's something that my father discovered in the play handbook for playground safety that's been a very um, sort of foundational uh, sort of design criteria that we abide by. Spencer, can I ask you, what is this mesh that's... Oh, the mesh is handmade by us on site. And it's, um, it's kind of the secret special sauce, if you will, <laughs> in Lucky Climbers. Um, it takes a lot of... Uh, painstaking technique and a fastidious attention to detail in order to execute. Um, and uh, the guys that do it are really very, very talented craftspeople. Um, so you can see here on the right that it's kind of this weird structure with these um, three columns that sort of twist around each other. And um, so it's kind of it's almost a tent, what's known as a tensegrity structure. If it weren't for these um, three pipes bracing it in the middle, um, it would be a pure tensegrity structure. And a tensegrity structure is unique in that um, all of the tension members, like this big cable right here, are in purely in tension, and all of the compression members are purely in compression. Um, it's just, it was just a sort of another weird way of making something. Um, that my father and I came up with one day while we were arguing. <laughs> hey, maybe it's good to argue. <laughs> Next slide, yeah. This one here is in um, Columbus, Indiana. And uh, if you've never been to Columbus, Indiana, you should all go. It's, you said they had wonderful architecture Yes, there. some of the best in the world. It's really, really quite remarkable. Really. There's two Aero Saarinen buildings there. Um, he's the guy that, that made the hockey rink here. As well as, as well as Morrison Stiles Colleges. Um, so he's got a real association with Yale. And uh, so this is um, in what's known as Columbus Commons. It's an indoor public park. And um, the idea behind this climber was to not only um, help with the sort of branding campaign of the town, with the C is their um, registered logo, um, but also to make a place where um, kids of all ages could get together. So this one's made with more generous proportions between the, between the uh, panels so that um, teens and little kids can play together and hang out. But still they can never fall more than 18 inches? Correct. But on the, on the ones that are more um, centered towards little kids, um, the, uh, the platforms are much closer together because the, the concept is so if you can um, mitigate kids' ability to stand up, if they can't stand up, then they can't fall down. Hmm. You want them crawling around. That's the safest way to go. Yeah, yeah. How high are your um, installate? How high are the Well, this climbers? one's about 40 feet tall. And they range from what to what? Um, the shortest one we did was uh, about 10 feet tall. And they go from 10 to 45? Yeah, 10 is not such a great height. No. Climber. Well, not enough. Move. You just can't. You, by the time you get up, you've hit the ceiling. Yeah, right. And it's not very efficient. Okay. okay. Um, this one here is at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, oh. um, and you can see that it's made out of glass. It's meant to be. Uh, this one's called the neural climber, so it's um, meant to be analogous to the inner workings of your brain. Um, the glass platforms are really cool because I think that uh, it's, again, it's sort of an analog of um, sort of intuition and contemplation vis-a-vis -vis like translucency and transparency and reflection. So, um, I don't know, it's a very... It's very beautiful. Very cool. Yeah, yes, it's very, very, beautiful. very beautiful. And it's in this black environment and it's got wow. a beautiful light show and soundtrack oh. that, that goes along oh. with it. And it's the most popular thing at the Franklin Institute. Proud to say. Yeah, it's very special. 
Um, this one here is in Mao Zedong's fourth wife's courtyard in oh Beijing, my China. Goodness. <laughs> um, and to the unacquainted, she's the one that started, or was one of uh, the gang of four who started the Cultural Revolution in China. Um, not a particularly popular figure these days, but there it is, nonetheless. There's her courtyard. Um, and so this one is loosely modeled off of the yin yang symbol. It's sort of got a split symmetry thing going on with the superstructure. And then these panels, which were actually stained by my wife. Bria, um, are meant to be ev evocative uh, of Chinese calligraphy. I don't know how um, successful it is on those grounds, but I love the colors and I love the energetic um, disposition of it. Yeah, I do too. Your wife is an art therapist, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. This one here is at the Liberty Science Center in Jersey City. This one scares me. Yeah. This, this one is up to the balcony. Oh, yep. my, my wife wouldn't even go in it. Yeah, this one, yep. I don't know that I could. Which I think is super cool. <laughs> um, and uh, so these guys, they wanted something that was scientific, but they were very, you know, they, they, they weren't really specific about it. So. Um, I have this, or had this friend, he's since passed, named Erwin Auer, who um, was obsessed, he's an artist, he used to teach at Yale, and he was obsessed with um, the suture curve, which are the stitches on a baseball. And um, his, his thing was that if you, if you rotated the stitches, which he did in, a, in drawings, he would draw the, the figure of this, the suture curve, um, revolving around, you could spell the alphabet with all of the shapes that you would get. So I took his concept and made it into, you know, instead of his 2D studies, I made this three-dimensional thing. Um, and what you see is a function of where you sit. So it changes shape as you go around it. I mean, it doesn't really, it's always sort of a ball, but um, all of these various components never really give you a, a, a you know, because of perspective, et cetera, never give you a tr their true look. You always have to sort of interpret it. So there you see it's maybe making parts of a C or an E or something, the big figure. Um, but then there's also these other helixes that make up the interior structure of the thing. And so it's kind of like a big box truss, if you will. And um, the undersides of the platforms are uh, have a a drum wrap like you find on a, um, a drum set. Mm. Um, and it is this mica finish that um, sort of fools you about how, how deep it is. So it, you know, it, it, you, by looking at it, you'd think that it had a lot of texture, but then when you touch it, it's perfectly smooth. <laughs> so there again, it sort of fools, trick, plays with your perceptions of things. Um, but I think mostly it's just a kind of beautiful, compelling object. Um, the cantilevers uh, sort of violently off the wall. And, um, it was funny when I was pitching this to them. I knew I knew that they were going to let me build this when they said, "So you just step over the edge, then, do you?" <laughs> and, and, uh, you had them. <laughs> yep. Is this is that the curve? Is that the luan? Are these luan or these, these are, the are Yeah, these are luan. Yeah, luan. Right. I love the curves. Yeah, so you can see the, the um, floor below. Oh, this one. Oh, I think that's This one here is in um, Los Mochis, Mexico. Oh, it's gorgeous, though. And um, Los Mochis is a funny town. They, it's where they found El Chaco. And um, these guys actually owed me a lot of money. And then um, they found El Chapo and they paid me. So I don't know whether there's any connection, but there you go. <laughs> Um, and this is uh, loosely modeled after a um, jellyfish. So it's kind of a funny thing. You know, serendipity plays a large role in some of the things that I do. But um, basically, it started as an attempt to make a climber that um, the whole steel superstructure could fit inside of a container. So I was into this technique. Um, so then, it, and then I could just plop a roof on it and the, and the cables and or the platforms and cables. And it would be a fairly simple process, um, as opposed to constructing something on site and then having to tip it up or do some other version of that. Um, so this is a 
the first <clears throat> iteration of a climber that we did this way. And um, but because it's in Mexico, I thought it should have a shade structure associated with it. And um, so pretty soon, you know, I listed the thing over so that it would be a more effective shade structure, um, you know, by facing it due south and just so. And then, um, and then pretty soon it was just looking like a jellyfish. <laughs> and then when I sent them the pictures, they were, you know, they were all kind of like our red, toxic, crazy jellyfish like we have up here. Um, but then they said, no, 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 we have these Medusa jellyfish down here that are blue. Oh. So that's, that's why it's blue. Oh, but it also fits so beautifully with their landscape. I know. I just oh adore this picture. Just it's one of my it. favorite photographs. Me too. And it's just, I love the way these cables frame it in these old buildings. It's really cool. I do. I love it. Yeah, it's a really gorgeous courtyard. It is. Wow. And there's a shot of it at night. Wow. Looking really freaky. <laughs> <laughs> And this is looking up um, through the center of it. Wow, it's so beautiful. This one is in um, at the Alamoana Mall in Honolulu, um, and it's uh, the idea here again was to have a shade structure, and um, and the client wanted it to be sort of I don't know wavy and underwater style. So um, I don't know. It's just kind of wavy and underwater <laughs> style. I, it's nothing and particularly explicit about any of it. But the colors. That's yeah. right. The colors and the shapes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just kind of, you know, groovy. I was really into this idea of, it actually came from this climber, which is a model of a thing that we made in Skokie, Illinois. And it's just a, again, I'm, you know, sometimes it's just a technique that kind of drives the whole story, but I was into this idea of the helix being held by these legs that are, um, you know, make a kind of, it's just like a really screwball uh, sawhorse or something. Um, That's when you design with your dad? Or no, I did that with my dad. Um, so this is like double that with a, with a canopy in between. Um, and there it is again. Uh, this is another project that we did at the Fun Museum in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And um, a few years prior to doing this, um, I'd seen a, a, this photograph in the New York Times um, that was of, or it's not a photograph, it's a rendering of a, um, the, in, the new interior of the American Natural History Museum. It was going to have this 100 foot tall ceiling, and they had this um, sort of funny mobile with you know whales and elephants and squid and all these other animals in it and I thought well you know that's pretty cool but it's also pretty obvious like the, you know the, anyone who's been in the American Natural History Museum will tell you this is just gigantic whale in one of their galleries and so it's sort of a riff on all of that and I thought you know they could do better than this and and I could help so um, I designed them this this and actually this is the model of it right here um, this thing that I thought would be really great and it, it was based on this idea that kids would wander through this kind of landscape of, of eyeballs of different types of, of um, animal eyeballs animal eyeballs are they're all kind of unique um, in their own special way and adaptive to um, whatever their circumstances so it's like sheep have these hor horizontal eyes and um, predators have vertical eyes because it helps them with their depth perception um, but then there's also like bug eyes, which have the you know the, the many lenses, and um, you know, and then there's fish eyes that have these um, you know kind of amazing flushing things, you know, features that they have. Anyway, eyeballs are all wow, really crazy and beautiful and different and oh. and colorful and gorgeous. And I thought it would be a great way for kids to acquaint themselves with other animals and develop maybe a little bit of empathy for them. Wow. So, oh, I wanted to, so Spencer, are these painted or how? how no, are that's. It's, it's computer images on them? No, those what? are photographs that are then printed onto um, laminate. Okay. Oh, it's gorgeous. Wow. Um, this is a very recent project that we did in Irvine, California at the Spectrum Center. Um, and it's very much like the climber that we did at the Alamoana Mall, or this little guy right here. It's just 
bigger and crazier and um, and uh, I think bigger and crazier again translates into more smiles. I think that the bigger the climber is, the more kids it'll absorb and the longer it'll absorb them for. I think um, you know kids more than anything just want to be with other kids. Mm. That's really their main fascination. And so a situation like this affords a lot of different social act, social actions. And um, so you know kids on this side of the climber can come and hang out and then they might just discover that end at some later point and you know find another little scene going on down there anyway I don't really know what exactly happens inside of these <laughs> things but I know that they are um, sort of social centrifuges and they can enter at many different places yep there's a bunch of yep. entrances and, and ways to walk end. through and yeah. the underside of it is actually quite so sort of as beautiful as anything you know somehow that reminds me of nasturtium flowers I Does just it? love it. Yeah, it's just yeah. so happy and beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, this one is in Maui at this mall in, called Whaler's Village. This is actually the model of it. Oh. I don't always make models, but sometimes I do, or we do. Um, I can't actually claim that I make a model. But the idea is that this is a, um, the, each one of these columns is kind of like a palm tree. Palm trees mm -hmm. grow in these funny ways. They come up you know, out of the ground at a you know, 45 degree angle and then sort of make their way up. So I decided that those were kind of, a, that was sort of a funny place to start. And so I, I got three of those because you always have to have three points of contact with, to, to make something stable. So that's sort of like the, the basic um, thing. And then starting point. And then um, I sort of messed around with them until I thought that they made a silly funny looking thing and um, so there it is it's very popular and Maui's a great wow. place this one's in um, at the River Point Church down in Houston Texas and um, on this one there's a point farther up isn't there yeah because it yeah, the, yeah even farther because it really looked to me like a steeple a spire yeah a sp yeah it's just yeah Beautiful, right? There yeah, we go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, I try to avoid sort of explicit references, but this was the the, the site was very compelling, and it mm -hmm. seemed like a, um, a tower like this would be appropriate. And then the um, it's a very big sort of um, non-denominational, uh, very. Um, has, it, it appeals to a very broad demographic, so I thought it was appropriate to make all the panels different colors. Next slide, oh. please. That's it. That's it. Oh my God. Yay, we did it. Wow, well, we did it, Spencer. You know, your father had said something that I thought was very poetic and beautiful. Uh -huh. He said that these structures to him were like fountains and the children was like, were, were like the water. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was very beautifully said. It is beautiful. Yeah. Spencer, this has been um, amazing. Um, you are more than more than awesome oh, uh, it has been such you're years. more than awesome come on <laughs> <laughs> it, it, joe we th joe you want to come on to yeah because we well, just like, like to, to you know uh, <laughs> i can scooch down here and, and thank you so much what it's just been uh, fantastic yeah. amazing and, and it really inspiring such an inspiration the things that you've uh, done here yeah uh, so i i trust that the viewing audience has found Spencer and his creations as as awesome and inspiring as we have. So please uh, join us next month in April as we will visit and talk with Wendy Cowles, the director of the Brantford Food Pantry. So for now, thank you for joining us on Meet Your Neighbors. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>